my name is Erin Kenny, and I am from the United States. Uh, I live near Seattle, Washington, and I'm the director and co-founder of Cedar Song Nature School. Uh, I started um, all outdoor and nature immersion summer camps in the early 2000s, and my idea was to connect children with nature so that they would develop environmental stewardship. So I started working with eight to 12 year olds and having camps that were completely outdoors. Um, at the time though, I was um, presenting the kids with a lot of structured activities, um, projects that I thought were really cool, like making your own nature journal and doing leaf rubbings and herbal remedies. We were making our own nettle hair conditioner and planting lip balm. And what I started noticing was that the kids were really starting to ask for more downtime, more time to just be in nature rather than doing the environmental activities that I was presenting them with. And so each day they would ask me for more time to just run in the forest and build huts and climb. And I realized that these kids today were just asking for the same kind of natural childhood activities that I had experienced as part of my childhood. Well, I grew up in the 60s and we had all the freedom to spend huge amounts of time in nature with no adult supervision. And that experience allowed me to bond really closely with the natural world. It also gave me a sense that there was great therapy in nature. As I spent time just immersed in the natural world as a kid, I learned to feel safe in nature and a certain amount of comfort. And I realized it was really relaxing. And I started to seek out nature when I was feeling upset because I knew of its uh, effect, the calming effect that it had on me. And I started thinking about kids today and how they don't have access to large chunks of time out in nature that are unstructured and unscheduled. And when I thought back about the type of intimate connection that that led uh, towards nature for me and my adult environmental conservation work, my need to be out in nature, my understanding of nature as a therapy and how it can be self-soothing, these are the kinds of things that today's children were missing out on. So I started allowing these summer camps to just unfold and the whole five hours that the kids were with me, we had no structured activities, no schedule. The kids just ran freely through the forest and they started reporting back to me that this was their favorite summer camp, their favorite nature camp. And I started realizing that most other nature camps that these kids were going to were very, very scheduled. And so each of the environmental activities had a specific place in the agenda or curriculum. And it felt a lot like school to the kids, even though they were outdoors. As I said, what they really wanted to do was exactly what I experienced in my childhood, free play in nature for an extended um, period of time. So I kind of had this understanding in um, the early uh, 2000s when I began thinking about the idea of an all outdoor preschool. When my son was three, I started looking around for preschools for him and I was really dismayed to learn that most of the preschools on our tiny little rural island are almost primarily indoors. And the kids only go outdoors if it's quote unquote, nice weather. And in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest of the US, it rains about nine or 10 months of the year. And so when one of the le most frequently asked questions I get is, what do you do with the children when it's raining? Um, really, I wonder if people are expecting that we're gonna be keeping them indoors. So I didn't think that was a very good uh, match for my very active outdoorsy three-year-old. So I started a forest kindergarten uh, on my little tiny island with the help of my good friend, Robin Rogers. And we really didn't know if parents would be willing, American parents would be willing to drop their two-year-old off in the pouring rain in the middle of winter and drive off to a nice warm cafe for their coffee. And so our program is four hours um, and it's for two to six-year-olds. 
we're a huge believer in the multi-age model, as I know teacher Tom is. There's great learning to be had um, for both the youngers and the olders in a multi-age model. And I'm sure you all know about the benefits of that. Lucky for me, uh, four or five Vashon Island parents had decided to enroll their children in this outdoor preschool that they had never heard of called a forest kindergarten. Basically, I was modeling my forest kindergarten after the German Wald kindergartens, or so I thought, until I actually went on a study trip to Berlin about five or six years ago, and I got to observe some German Wald kindergartens, and I realized that in the United States, we were actually doing some things a little bit differently. And I realized that each country that has a forest kindergarten model, it's going to look slightly different because of our uh, cultural expectations and boundaries. So the first thing I noticed is that in the United States, the forest kindergarten uh, model that we've developed is a lot more playful. Our teachers are a lot more playful and interactive with the children. And that being said, we don't direct their play, we don't suggest their play, but we are very, very playful with them. And once they have a play scenario kind of established and going, we then step back and step out of their play. We remove ourselves so that we allow our um, entire program to be child-directed and interest-led. The second part I noticed was that we are very fond of inquiry-based teaching uh, at Cedar Song. And one of the main reasons that we do this is as a naturalist and a, a born natural scientist, I have a high level of curiosity for following up with questions on what is that? What does it look like? What is it doing? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? All those sensory leading questions to encourage the children to use all their senses to explore various aspects of nature. We also are what I call a compassion scaffolded program. So every time we're working with the kids, we get opportunities to bring in lessons in empathy and compassion. So our children are very, very respectful and gentle with all aspects of the natural world. And we coach them um, on how to carefully move living creatures out of our play space so we won't harm them. And they call this a slug rescue or a millipede rescue. And this um, instilling this kind of compassion at a really early age has so many positive effects because it, it really becomes a lifelong quality. And these young children are educating their parents because we had one five-year-old boy who became really conflicted and concerned after he watched um, the teachers guide the children to carefully remove a spider from our picnic table and gently place it on the forest floor. And he shared with us that his mom asks him to kill the spiders in his house. And this little boy was really conflicted because he is now starting to understand that even if you don't love all parts of nature, you have to respect it. And he was really internalizing that message. So we encouraged him to go home and talk to his mom about other ways that he could remove spiders from their home rather than killing them. So it was really neat to see his this little five-year-old's lessons and compassion that he was learning in our program um, carry over into his home life. As forest kindergartens and forest schools get more and more popular in the United States, um, I became very concerned with um, the problem in the United States is nobody's watching. There's no guidelines. There's no regulations. There's no, um, there's no standards. So anybody could open a school or program and call it a forest kindergarten or call it a forest school without any real understanding of the under, underlying pedagogy. And also, I was worried um, that people wouldn't attend um, carefully enough to the risks and hazards and that it would 
feed into um, American culture's fear of letting their kids go outdoors or connecting with nature because it's seen as fearful and dangerous. So as you know, running an outdoor program takes a a lot of attention to detail about the risks and uh, hazards that may accompany the program. And we want to expose our children to minimal risk because we understand all the benefits of it. So I started the nonprofit uh, NGO, American Forest Kindergarten Association, to address this issue and try to get some kind of standards for what is the American Forest Kindergarten model and also some best practices, guiding practices. And through the work of the board of directors, of that organization. We have also a great advisory council. David Sobel is on our advisory council from the US, Enid Elliott from Canada, um, University of Victoria, and several others who are helping us, the board of directors, come up with these guidelines. But we kind of came up with a definition of the American forest kindergarten model, which as I said, is slightly different than the German fault kindergartens. The first principle of the American forest kindergarten model is that it is an outdoor program. So it's all outdoors all the time. Now it can be used in conjunction with any other indoor program, but when you are outdoors with the children, it follows what we call nature immersion. And the definition of nature immersion, and when I first started doing this work, there was no definition for nature immersion. People were thinking that just going out, anytime you went outdoors was nature immersion. Maybe when you're playing sports or swimming, that's nature immersion. But to me, nature immersion means something different. My definition of nature immersion is unstructured, free play in nature, resulting in an intimate, deep, and personal connection with the natural world. So the nature immersion I'm talking about is that unstructured time in nature. And the benefit of that is that, well, there are so many benefits, but the one I'm just going to speak on real briefly is children today have to undergo so many transitions throughout the day They're basically scheduled from the minute they get up till the minute they go to bed, especially preschoolers. They really have very, very little free time. And so this sense of timelessness and spaciousness that you can achieve when you spend hours outdoors without structure is extremely relaxing and also fits more with a preschooler's timeline. It it takes them a while to really get engaged and immersed in whatever project, whatever focus uh, of where they want to be. Um, And so I will see kids for two or three hours just sitting in one spot digging because they're enjoying the sensation or they're exploring the different colors of dirt or they're mixing it with water and seeing how much water will make what kind of mud and doing all these rich scientific experiments just as they're exploring nature in a very authentic and free way. So all outdoors and and free flow, unstructured time. The teachers are guides and mentors So it's not teacher directed. We may offer activities to the children, but there are no required activities. We use an inquiry-based teaching method. That's part of the American Forest Kindergarten model. And the final piece is that we're very, very particular about documentation of the learning. As I said, every um, practitioner in, in every different country is going to have to Um, focus or tend to different pieces of this depending on what your cultural norms and expectations are. So in the United States, we have a strong expectation of that preschoolers uh, demonstrate measurable learning. We want to know exactly what they're learning and how they're learning, even if they're only three and four. And unfortunately, what that looks like to a lot of parents They're feeling the pressure to enroll them in these um, highly academic programs early on. There are now math programs and reading programs for three and four-year-olds, and American parents are encouraged to have their five children, as young as five, fully able to read when they enter kindergarten. The other problem we have in the United States is previously, um, 
the, the curriculum that's being taught in the American public school kindergartens now is the previous first grade curriculum. So I often um, counsel our parents to delay their children's start in formal education in a public school until at least age six, when I think the curriculum they're going to be presented with is more age appropriate. I just feel, as I'm sure most of you do, that from birth to age five or six, the most appropriate education is authentic play, and I'm gonna argue in the outdoors as well. <laughs> So we also believe very much in loose parts. Um, the American Forest Kindergarten model does not use tools in the same way the German vault kindergartens do. We don't generally use knives or hammers and nails, that kind of thing. The children are encouraged to use their imagination. What can they find in nature that represents a saw? What can they use for a hammer? That kind of thing. And they're just using sticks and rocks and leaves for the most part. One of the things uh, as I uh, began to reflect on the fact that in the United States uh, there are no standards or regulations. Um, there really also is no uh, teacher training for the forest kindergarten model. So that's something that I spearheaded in the United States and I have the Cedar Songway uh, teacher training program. And one of the things that I want to encourage everybody is that um, this children in nature piece, I think, is so important not to get hung up on what kind of, whether you have a bachelor's degree or whether how much early childhood education credits you have, because I think that really, in my mind, the most important things are passion, awe and wonder, and authenticity. And those are really the most important ways that you're going to connect with children in nature. Um, you have to really love working with young children, as I'm sure most of you do. I say I'm the kind of person that actually gets energized when I'm around young children, whereas a lot of adults lose energy around young children. I also have a great core need to be outdoors, and I'm sure if you're interested in the forest kindergarten model, you also have experienced a need to be outdoors. So sometimes I say that... Um, I really started the whole forest kindergarten for myself because it assures me of my outdoor time every day. Because even as um, Cedar Song has become more well known and my work has become more well known, I am still in the field almost every day, especially now that my health is back. I had some serious health challenges the last two years. But now I am out there with the kids, working with the kids, working this model. And I think that's a really important way that I can form when I do speak to audiences. Um, everything I can talk about is really fresh. And I'm still really connected to the hands-on running of the model, as well as being involved with the teacher training and going out and speaking at con conferences. Um, I just wanted to also mention the important work um, in the United States that's being done uh, by Angela Hanscom. Uh, she wrote the book Balanced and Barefoot, and it really lays out the um, physical therapy and occupational therapy benefits for children in an all outdoor program, in that most of the physical therapy benefits that you would see out uh, indoors through PT exercises, you would also uh, achieve those outcomes in the outdoor setting. And the child potentially would be more relaxed and breathing fresh air, natural lighting, and it would re reduce their sensory overload. One of the things that we've noticed in our program is we tend to get um, quite often children who have been diagnosed with uh, mild autism, Asperger's, ADHD, or what we call in the U.S. sensory processing issues or sensory processing disorder. Um, those children, I feel sort of like Richard Louv does in the sense that I look at ADHD as a natural outcome to keeping children indoors. And when I read the symptoms for ADHD, I say that's a normal preschooler. And so if people are bothered by that level of energy or the fact that they can't sit in a chair, first of all, then it's probably not an age appropriate curriculum. And second of all, just get them outdoors. So um, we're working with kids as young as two and they all, uh, for four hour classes outdoors and those two year olds, whether it's pouring rain or cold, since we have them appropriately dressed, 
they're really just not complaining. They're loving it. And I feel so good every day knowing how these children are benefit in building their sense of uh, environmental stewardship, their understanding that all of nature is alive and that they're a part of nature. Um, their sense of nature as a place to self-soothe, a place that they can access on their own when they need to, um, and they can carry that into adulthood, knowing how nature relaxes and grounds them. They've had experience with that. And also, every day I see the discoveries and experiments and conclusions that these children come up with. It is absolutely a natural science program. And when children are learning these um, natural science principles in a hands-on experiential way, those lessons are retained so much longer and uh, the learning is instilled so much deeper. I've had three-year-olds remember a certain bird that we see in the spring that's pretty rare on our island. And she was three, year old, three years old the first year that she saw it and we made a big deal about it because it came, had come back and represents spring. It's called the varied thrush. And the next year when she was four, she spotted that bird and without anybody saying anything, she said, there's the very thrush. And I'm thinking, this child isn't even in conscious memory yet, according to most <laughs> early childhood educators. So it's fascinating to me to see how well children can retain information if it's, if it's gained experientially and, and in relative terms. So, of course, ours is a totally place-based education program because everything those children are learning are things they are actually witnessing and touching and smelling and tasting and hearing.